There she is, Dr. Cheney. After listening to me swearing in the cath lab because we were having so many issues with this guy's leg trying to get his PCI done. We actually, it was fun. We, we ended up putting an eight French arrow sheath in and the Amplat super stiff wire we used to put it in came out like this. <laughs> really Amy, cool. you're on mute. Ah, sounds a little bit like yesterday with your um, attempted snaring in the PL. Oh, that was so frustrating. Oh my God. Yeah, it's it's not not often you get to see people snaring, having a going down a vein graft in the PDA, get into the PL, and then go down the native into the PL, and then snare in the PL to grab the externalized wire to rip it out, change directions, and get it externalized. But better than that, then unable to pass a balloon across either direction. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> because because they they had, the they had stented across. And the stent, we couldn't, the stent was going this direction and that everything else was going that way. We literally, we got a couple balloons across, some compliant balloons across, and they looked like U's. Oh. It was, <laughs> shit flow down when we're done, but there's no way on God's earth I'm going to get it stented. Um, all right, well, let's, let's try to get us moving here. I see the usual suspects. So what this is supposed to be about is... When we started doing CTOs a long time ago, and when I say we, I basically mean Craig Thompson, Aaron Grantham, Mike Wyman, and Tony Martini. And if you don't know who those people are, it makes me sad um, because really we were the sort of really early adopters of CTO PCI in the US. And when we started, there was this thing called the Japan CTO Club, and many of us went over there for different reasons. And then there became the European CTO Club. And so everybody kept asking when we're going to have a club. And the five of us sort of sat down and realized none of us would want to join a club that would take us as members of that club. And we also felt that clubs were exclusive and restrictive, whereas a community is inclusive and wants to help and support. So we always talked about the CTO community. It's not a geography, it's not Canada, it's not North America, it's not Europe, it's not Japan. CTO PCI, the mentality behind it is a community. Now, when I started doing this, I had a community, we had you know, those five guys, and when things went wrong, we could call and talk to each other, and they were the only people that understood what we did. And that community grew, and yet the next generation, people like Dimitri and Cal and Bill Nicholson and Jay and a but you know, Ashish Prashad and a whole bunch of other people. But the, the point of this now is a lot of the fellows coming out, you're missing out on the community. You may have your own local faculty, but you don't know each other as well. And so part of this is to try and get you guys to start interacting in a way that you have people to lean on and you have people outside of your silos to help you deal with the emotional events that are gonna occur. And those are gonna occur professionally and they're gonna occur, occur personally. And you need people there to help support you. And rarely will the people in your own group be those people because not many of us were fortunate enough to work in a place that had that kind of support or infrastructure around it. So what I'm hoping is we can break some of the silos down, hear different opinions and different approaches. Hopefully you all can start to meet some other people. Initially it'll be virtually. I know Kevin and I have talked eventually we're gonna to try to get an in-person group together to help break this down and let people uh, you know, get to know each other and to get to share opinions and to share a lot of the struggles because there are a lot of struggles. Kevin or Sanjog, do you wanna to add to that? Kevin, I know you were really, you know, wanted to get this started. So any other thoughts about the goals of this project? Yeah, I think you know it's been really neat to see the number of places which have complex PCI fellowships, you know, it, 
starting to approach 10 uh, on a given year, maybe even more than that. We kind of had to put our feelers out to friends to make sure we were including all of them. But we realized that with COVID, we didn't have a chance to get our fellows to meet each other. And there were a couple efforts that we had done to try to trade fellows among programs, but travel and access and restriction because of uh, virus issues were a problem. But I think we, it looks like we've got some buy-in to maybe have an in-person meeting really which mirrors some of the older um, master's CTO courses that used to be run for those of us that were training behind Bill and others, where you get, you know, 15 or 20 attendees and probably four or five cases and guest faculty and you have a chance to interact. And so I think we potentially are going to have a chance to do that in the fall this year. But in the meantime, Bill had kindly offered to use the UW Zoom format to get it kicked off. And I think one of the cool things that Bill thought to do is engage the current CHIP fellows to help us build a curriculum that they would find valuable, as opposed to hearing a bunch of gray-haired guys like us talk about what we think is valuable. So, the, just, you know, from the get-go, it's meant to be, you know, inclusive even in terms of content of what our fellows would like to have covered, things that, you know, are interesting and sort of valuable to them. And so, we're super excited to get this off the ground. And I think just to echo Bill's point, one of the nicest things professionally for me, as I started to do this, is the really dear and close friends professionally that this has allowed me to contact, and I learn from every one of them in every session like this with you. And so, I appreciate your organization, stewardship, Bill, and we're just happy to be here. Alex, have it. Sanjog, any comments about a little bit of your journey and the the importance of that professional connection? Yeah, I, I echo all of the comments that have been made so far. I think uh, I, mean, I consider myself extremely, extremely lucky because. Uh, some of my nearest and truly dearest friends, mentors, people with whom I share very close personal relationships that come out of this enterprise. Uh, it, you know, comes uh, ultimately all of these things come out of finding a common base, right? Some way, some language in which you can communicate with one another and then share ideas that are of interest mutually. And, you know, if you look through the pandemic and how, how innately isolating that has been, meetings like this complex pci exchange forms they're cropping up everywhere they persist and they persist and they persist because it selects out a certain type of individual and i think that the common thread amongst those individuals is we all learn from each other we all talk with one another we all try to get better to, for tomorrow um you know and and be better than we were today and uh and so not only do these types of meetings foster those kind of relationships and connections but I think they also give us an opportunity to, to you know, create new things like Kevin, and, you know, and and you and and the other educational leaders in this space are doing, right? So, so I, I my journey has been has been largely one of making connections, making friendships, making you know trusted relationships that that have fulfilled me day in day out. Awesome. Well, I, I know there's a lot of people in the background, so. My, my hope is eventually actually we'll have more of the CHIP fellows on this side of the firewall rather than the other side so that we can see faces and we'll get dialogue going. We're gonna have to work out some logistics. So I apologize for our first run. For those of you on the other side of the firewall, please use the Q&A or chat feature to, to text in some questions and we'll try to address them. Um, we're gonna start with the, the opening event. We are very fortunate to have Michael Bodie, who is from the, the Harvard High-Risk PCI program and Amy Cheney, who is six weeks from being my partner at the University of Washington as she finishes her high-risk PCI program. So we're lucky to have them. Um, and what we're hoping tonight and what I hope with all of these is we do not want these to be super, PowerPoint didactic lecture stuff. We want, I, I'm sort of angry that I didn't get to go home and have a glass of wine. I'm at my office still, but we want these to be pretty casual and laid back. And so we want them to be, we, we're hoping that the high risk fellows will bring a case that helps them to understand or present some of the challenges that they may wanna deal with or understand. And we can then use that as a very casual environment. We can sort of see where it goes. So the, the idea is not to be very structured here. Um, so I guess with that, if there's no questions in the chat or from the panel, let's see. Sanjog, you're the, you're the only non-denominational person here. 
because Kevin and I are both their bosses. So who do you want to hear from first, Michael or Amy? You know, if I look at myself, I'm an equal opportunity kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> no, Amy is in the middle of my screen. And so it's going to be Amy first. All right. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so That's I will tell you that I, I will put in the least amount of effort possible to get the maximum game. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> Sanjog, right in front of me. <laughs> and Sanjog and Kevin, she's my fellow, so you guys need to answer all these damn questions because she's so <laughs> tired of hearing from me. Uh, all, right. all right, I'll share my screen and true to what Bill said, there will be no PowerPoint um, slides. We're just going to dive into a case and I'll kind of talk you through it bypass grafting back in 1999 um, with a Lima to his LAD, um, vein grafts to his OM, Diag, and PDA, and basically presented to an outside hospital with unstable angina. He'd been very, very active and then suddenly it had a big decline and started having rest symptoms. So these are the films from the outside facility. You can see his Lima's patent, but he's obviously got some distal um, disease down there and some collaterals going to the right couple of pictures of the Lima here. We'll just move along. He has um, vein graft that's patent to his PDA, but you can see it's very heavily stented and um, has been intervened upon multiple times. We're seeing a vein graft here to his diagonal, which looks okay. And then we get to what the outside hospital appropriately identified as the culprit for his symptoms, which was this heavily stented um, vein graft to his obtuse marginal. And you can tell um, before the dye even fills that tragically, one of our worst um, issues is when we come along, as everyone knows, to patients who have had stents placed across the anastomosis. And he has not one, but two layers of scent across that anastomosis to the OM. And then you can see there's disease distal to that and more proximal to that, it's just kind of a mess. Um, so fortunately he was able to, and then also you can see the ostium of that uh, vein graft was stented as well. So he was fortunately able to get out of the hospital on multiple antianginals and basically showed up in our clinic. We had a discussion with him as we always do um, in terms of risk benefit, helping him understand why to proceed with this. And basically a couple of days later, we're able to bring him to the lab um, with the plan to open up his native um, left main, which I have neglected to show you. Let me just get to that, into his um, uh, circumflex OM system. And you can see they have trouble engaging the left main. Um, it's sort of occluded distally a little bit of a beak into that OM, but in general, no native flow into his circumflex system. So we came ready with um, bifemoral access, eight French long sheaths and came up and engaged obviously the left main and then this um, vein graft to his circumflex or OM system. And you can see we've got a wire retrograde trying to come up into the OM. And we come down with a turnpike uh, LP with a gladius, which we managed to knuckle down. And we've got a wire coming up retrograde. We actually, there aren't pictures here, but we did try to set up a reverse cart and had a trap liner, 3020 balloon, tried to balloon and get overlapping knuckles and just couldn't make it work. So actually converted to cart. So ballooning on the retrograde wire. Um, so you can see we've got a, a first a 1.5 and then a 3020 balloon. And essentially we're successful with this method. And um, you can see that wire go up there. And eventually come down, it's a little bit hard to see but we have trapped in a Sasuke on the anagrade system and then come down with a Xion wire. And after all of the uh, work that we did with retrograde ballooning, we were able to wire into the um, distal native OM and get past that um, stent. And Amy, I'm gonna pause you for a second. So 
you know, a lot of us who, when we started doing CTOs, we actually, everything we did was CART, retrograde balloons. And the reason we did retrograde ballooning here is that an astronautic angle is so tight, we couldn't torque the retrograde wire to make it work. So in that situation, it's much easier just to deliver a balloon and do CART. So for everybody out there, if you haven't seen it, it's really important to, uh, to uh, remember that retrograde ballooning is still a very viable situation to solve problems. So if you're having problems torquing a retrograde wire, think about uh, doing CART. Uh, there's a question of how we got retrograde on that. Dumb luck. The wire went down. <laughs> Literally, as we put the wire in as a placeholder, the wire flipped and went that direction. And we're like, okay, we'll take it. So I agree. The angle's terrible, and we got lucky. Hey, Phil, uh, did you give me thoughts on just getting a, a pilot or mongo down to the stent and poking at it to have it sort of be a buttress target, or was that too hard to do? We no, that was our that was our backup plan, Kevin. Yeah. But since we'd gotten in retrograde and we could get it all opened up, mm -hmm. it seemed easier to do cart the traditional direction rather than cart with balloon down and and wire antigrade. The other is this does from having to, to stab through the stent to yeah. do that, which can be harder. In in old school cart through a dead draft is probably the easiest way. Uh, what balloons do you like to go through the septum? What length, shaft length? Can you talk us through that, Bill? Yeah, so I've taken a 4.0 balloon retrograde through the septals and a 4.5 through an epicardial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the rewrap size is pretty close to a Corsair. You got to be somewhat careful. I tend to like the Abbott balloons over Boston and Medtronic. The reason being is the shaft lengths are five centimeters longer. Yep. So Boston and Abbott or Boston Medtronic are 138. Abbott is 143. I, I, if I have them, I'd rather use an over the wire balloon for retrograde than an RX. And the reason being is you tend to get the RX portion outside the guide. And so you lose some push because you don't have the guide to help control it. It's not a super big deal. I've done it both ways, but if I was paying for it, that's, Probably the only place other than alcohol septal ablation, an over the wire balloon has value anymore. Um, but those are the things to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the length was what I was hoping you touched yeah. on because there are differences among the people that produce them. Perfect. For, for some of the tighter, more tortuous collaterals, um, the other thing that I've noticed that helps is if you've got a wire retrograde and you can get a microcatheter through, switch for a more supportive wire, something stiff that has some backbone, right? Because the Initially, particularly in the septals, as they take that hairpin turn coming down through the septum where you're having difficulty, and sometimes they can even get a little bit of a cardio. Uh, having a stiffer wire uh, not only does it <coughs> easier to actually deliver your balloon, but then your transit on the wire with your retrograde guide becomes a lot more stable. So you have a less light, you have less likelihood of sucking the guide in uh, distally. You can pull it back easily and then remove the balloon and go back and forth. The other point to mention is the Turumo's, um, they're Rayuri balloons everywhere else in the world except for the States, their Takeru's there, where the slip coating on those really makes them easy to deliver practically anywhere. Yeah, and Bill, just one, one sort of looking ahead, you know, it seems like you've made great progress, but as a person that fights blown up and badly placed stents for a living, I would anticipate the hard part of this case is about to start as you try to get through Nope. The double layer part. So interesting. Nope. To see here. No, nope. good. All right, cool. <laughs> this, this is going to get way more interesting, which is going to lead to building a practice. Keep going, Amy. <laughs> yeah. We're through we the, haven't, the rest of this is boring. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. Great. Um, yeah. So basically, from here, we just dilate with the 2.5 um, to facilitate IVIS and essentially. Um, I'll just draw your attention to this picture here because you can see that there is um, obviously that OM that was grafted is open, but there's also a second OM and then the native circ that you can see. So we bonus go ahead. Bonus vessel. Bonus vessel, which we mm -hmm. have fondly come to <laughs> refer to this as. <laughs> um, so we end up placing a 3048 stent with IVIS guidance and overlap that with I think a 4020. And here is our sort of 
result and we couldn't be happy with this. We thought, you know, that looks great, but we're missing that OM2. Oh, bonus vessel. The bonus, bonus vessel. vessel. I'm going to get the bonus oh. vessel. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, does, does Kevin and Sandra, does that wire look like it's in for all the world in China? Does that look in? It doesn't look out. Yeah. Well, wait till you see the next picture after we balloon on it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so this, this was a Mongo. I mean, and of course, of course there... bonus vessel was not, in fact, a bonus vessel. It was <laughs> bonus track through fat on, on top of the heart. Oh, no, better than that. Like <laughs> yeah, so um, we felt like it was in, so we dilated. Um, and here you see the fateful balloon, which is followed by oh, fodder man. for the complications course. Um, so we go back up with our, we had a 3530 NC balloon. We just try to cover across where that OM2 comes off. You can see there's staining. So we're not, we're not really solving the problem. And uh, I'll kind of skip through these, but essentially we did some five minute inflations. We have echo at the bedside. Fortunately, we're actually, the patient is doing well. His hemodynamics are fine. He's starting to have pain, of course. But we ultimately decided to, you can see the ping pong guides there, bring in um, a seven French guidezilla or trap liner or something, and then delivered a 3526 papyrus covered stent. And unfortunately, even after that was deployed, we're still having extravasation. And, um, you know, serial echoes are happening. We have Definity and I'll describe the echoes up front, which is essentially that the patient was developing a left atrial compressive hematoma as well as a hematoma that was sort of lateral to the LV. And um, so- you guys, by, uh, Amy, you can see that in the lab on echo. Sometimes these post cabbage effusions with patients yeah. can be tough to see. Yeah, I'll actually show you um, some representative echo images. For whatever reason, our server is not allowing his echo images to come over. But unfortunately, we have two identical patients who <laughs> kind of had the same course. Um, so I'll show you those pictures in a moment. But by now, you know, pretty much when we called for the covered stent, Bill called for uh, one of our CT surgeons to come into the room. And we've got CT surgery, anesthesia. We're really making this decision as a team about what are we gonna do? And um, essentially we pulled the trigger on having the patient go to the operating room. And let me just, I'll show you um, some echo images here. As I said, this is from another uh, patient, but the images are essentially identical, unfortunately. Um, but I think this um, lays things out really nicely. So this was, this is almost identical four chamber view and you can see I've kind of labeled everything but that left atrium has become essentially a slit and there's this huge Amy, compressive hematoma. I don't see, do you see, I don't see the echo. Maybe, uh, yeah, Andrew is still up. Oh, I'm sorry, let me. Uh, you might be sure it's not asking. We're working on RC, we're working on it. There we go. How about here? Yeah. Can, it, can everybody figure that one out? <laughs> I've labeled it just in case it's unclear, but there's essentially, you can see the left atrium's completely obliterated and that it's this huge hematoma, which is causing the problem. And as we move along here, get a couple other images. This is, so, you know, this was evolving as we were moving along that left atrial hematoma and also a compressive hematoma that was sort of narrowing the um, LV. But these are images from the operating room and you can see on TE this hematoma that's obliterated the left atrium. And then um, what ended up happening is something that we have gained more and more comfort with our interventional program working with our CT surgeons, one of our CT surgeons, Chris Burke has developed or been part of the development of doing a left lateral thoracotomy to evacuate hematoma. And it seems like in the cases we've had more often than not, once that hematoma gets evacuated, the patient actually doesn't have residual bleeding and doesn't need further bypass. And that's what happened both with the patient 
um, that whose echoes images I'm showing and also with the patient I just described, um, our retired internist who um, had the, the perforation. So he had uh, um, the pericardium was evacuated. It was a large compressive hematoma. He had dramatic improvement, uh, didn't need bypass. Chest was closed up. He was in the hospital for six days, went home, actually came back two months later and we did his RCA-CTO because as we looked at in the diagnostic images, um, his RCA graft had been heavily stented. So sometime, somehow we maintained his, his faith in us and he's actually doing extremely well now. And um, apart from you know, expected post-operative pain after this you know, surgery, which I understand left lateral thoracotomies are pretty painful in the acute post-operative period, he did extremely well. So I wanted to use this case to kind of illustrate and set us up to talk or to hear from the experts about, you know, for those fellows who are leaving um, their fellowship and heading out and trying to start a new CTO program, who do you think are the really important stakeholders that they talk with um, kind of before they get into practice to sort of spread awareness and make sure everybody's on board with what, what is being brought to the program? Uh, I'll, I can start with that um, and share my thoughts because I've had to do this now a couple of times over the last little while. Um, for a fellow coming into a new job, so coming out of a CTO fellowship where, you know, functionally you've been given a fairly senior grab bag of tricks, but the, 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 the experiential learning isn't there yet you're fundamentally gonna be viewed a little differently than maybe the operator that's got that same senior grab bag of tricks, but has 10 years under you know, her belt. And so the approach to selecting relationships that matter is a little bit different because as a, as a young operator who's very, very skilled, you still need a shield. And so it's going to be important to select both partners within your lab as well as partners without or outside of your lab that are going to understand what you're trying to bring. I think the first step to selecting relationships is to try to understand what it is that they want from you. That's something that I learned when I went to the institution that I was at first, where I was hired to be a CTO operator, only nobody in that cath lab had any idea what that meant. And, and neither did the administration. All they knew is that they wanted a complex PCI operator because that was important, but that didn't mean anything. So when I got there and my first cases were, you know, horrendoplasties without really the mission brief or the warning, the nursing staff were terrified because they had no idea what they were looking at. So, so I learned the hard way that the earliest relationships that you actually have to make are with your your colleagues that don't do your work but that want to understand what it is that you're there to bring so that you know they understand what you're doing or what you're there to do is truly help patients right and that comes from educational talks that comes from hallway conversations that comes from you know the classical three a's right being available being affable being able obviously but then truly being willing to engage with people Meet with your administrators and find an administrator that understands why you've been hired, usually one of the people that was responsible for your hiring and make them your partner, make them your best friend. So you can ask them for their help. You set up a relationship where if you're doing something wrong or you're going off sort of left, they'll, there's enough comfort there for them to come and find you and have a conversation with you like a person. Um, admit to the fact that it's your, it's your, first experience out on your own and that's unique and you have a lot to learn but that you're a unique individual as well coming out with a senior grab bag of tricks and that that you together can chart that course make sure of course that you have a senior operator in the lab doesn't have to be somebody that carries the same skill set as you do though in my case i was lucky because the senior operator in my lab who ended up becoming one of my truly best friends was a similar operator but somebody that believes in you and that can tap you on the shoulder and say, stop, now is the time to walk away or 
let's talk to a couple more people before we do this. Because that senior advice, that ability to see the forest before, you know, before it, it's more than trees is really important. And then the other two most important people that I found were really important to me was I needed a really good relationship with my surgeon. And most important in that relationship was that my surgeon needed to know that I was not there to threaten him or her. We actually had one guy, one girl. And they both, the, I'm proud to say that my surgeon at my previous site, I still consider a mentor and have a good relationship with. And the, the female surgeon that was there was the one that interviewed me and helped to hire me and with whom I, I still share a friendship. That relationship was really important because they knew that I wasn't there to take cases away from them. We were there to work as partners so that patients were getting complete revascularization. And, and that's really what you put out as the goal over and over and over again. And the, the last person with whom you have the most important relationship, and this is a little bit more specific, are your heart failure docs. Because your heart failure people are the ones that control coronary disease. They are the ones that have the option of moving people to advanced therapies like that and transplant. And make no mistake, they don't necessarily see or are even exposed to the volume of complex intervention that you're able to provide. And so they don't know that people like you exist. And with a relationship with those individuals who understand the nature of ischemic disease and the type of effect that can have on symptoms and on longevity and on ventricular function, they can become your largest referring physicians as well as your biggest advocates. Because let's face facts, the heart failure docs know their patients inside out, backwards, upside down, way better than we ever will. That's my spiel. Kevin, what's your spiel? Yeah, I think uh, Sanjog is right on. I think one of the most fun and favorable things I had was a very parallel experience. They engaged two of our surgical colleagues uh, who were dear friends who gone on, unfortunately, to lead other programs because they were exceptional. So, you know, even things like seeing clinic patients together and calling back doctors, you know, to, to Sanjog's point, I was probably not a threat to them because a lot of the can you do this PCI patients that sent to me uh, from time to time, a cabbage was the right thing for them. And so we would co-evaluate them, call back the out-of-network referring doc and say, both of us are senior patients. We've spoken with your patient. This is what we recommend. And so it really becomes a complex revast program for which a lot of times as a CTO person, I was actually the intake dude that actually parsed out cases based on what they needed. And sometimes that's bad in transplant. But I mean, so... You end up having lots of touch points after you build a little bit of a capability such that it's easy to bring people into the fold to collaborate with you. And that collaborative approach to this is one of the most fun aspects of the job, from our local people to even having you know great relationships with colleagues like those on the call. The other thing which I don't have um, a whole lot of clarity on, but I think the sand jogs part, you need to be a little careful your first few months. And so building momentum in a measured and direct way. But if a case really, and you'll know this because you're all well-trained, but if a case has a super high complication profile, it's okay to do it, but you need to be clear on the consent process with the family. You need to get buy-in from multiple players, surgery, the heart failure doc, the person on service, such that in the off chance that something goes wrong, you've got a very clear talk track at m and &M, which allows you to have gone through the thought process in a way where doing the case for the patient was the right thing, even though the outcome may not have been good. And so it's better to also try and have those happen in your second, uh, in, your, in your six months after you start, as opposed to in the first couple months. And, and just being thoughtful and starting in a measured way the first couple months, I think is an important thing to be mindful of, especially if you don't have immediate backup, like Sanjog did with more senior people that were able to be there with him and be co-conspirators in either good outcomes or potentially in bad ones. You know, from a, from a relationship building perspective with surgeons in particular, just to briefly add, one, I think one of the things that surgeons want to see you do is be honest about the data and be honest about what you can provide and, and show that the investment is in complete revask as opposed to in you achieving the complete revask. And so my way of having set up relationships with my surgeons here who who are phenomenal and who are, who are really great partners um, was I gave them a talk about CTO PCI at their request, actually I gave them surgical grand rounds, which was great. It was really a, a, a very good icebreaker, but for the first few, uh, you know, surgery versus PCI discussions, particularly when there was a CTO involved, I actually asked the surgeon 
to go with me so that we could speak to the patient together and allowed the surgeon to hear me be honest about the fact that you're diabetic and I realize that you might want PCI. And I think technically I can probably get a reasonable result for you, but there's a good chance that you're going to get everything done by my colleague here in one shot and you're going to get a great result. That, that trust building conversation, I think, was very important in the beginning, beginning period. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, so this, it's funny, you know, I've been now at the U for seven years, but this summer, and actually literally a month before this case, we got two brand new transplant surgeons, both of them right out of training, both of them from, you know, one was from a very well-known East Coast program, the other had spent a year at that program and then spent some time actually at the Royal Jubilee in Glasgow. And, you know, we've had to it, it almost build it reverse. They're, they come in and they're like, they've never seen any of this because the centers they were in was, hadn't done it. So they didn't know what was going on. This conversation started really awkward because about the third time I'd met this surgeon and he came in and he started talking. And I said, no. This is what you're going to do. You have to trust me. I know more than you do. You're going to do a left lateral thoracotomy. There, you don't need to open the chest because it's not going to still be bleeding because that's why they want to do the thoracotomy. The, the sternotomy is they're worried there's going to be ongoing bleeding and they need to expose the heart. These always stop bleeding because they become compressive. So by the time they get to the OR, they've thrombosed. So all they need to do is pull the clot off and put the magic sprinkle dust on and everything's okay. And a left lateral thoracotomy in a post-cabbage patient is a nothing surgery. We, I've actually watched two of them now. It takes them 45 minutes, get in, get out, pop the clot out, put some dust and they're putting chest tubes on. And so it's really changed our threshold to this LA compression of even, we won't even wait for them to get shocky. It's like, we're seeing mitral velocity start changing. We're gonna go. We've done four of these now over the last three years. We're going to bring it up at the complications course in Orlando because it's such a reliable, quick, safe therapy for this situation. Um, but I agree, it's been a lot of work. The other advice I'll give to everybody, so I had a very famous person come up, spend a week here learning CTOs. And when she got done, she had nine appointments at her home institution to talk to people. So she had to go talk to the cath lab director about inventory. She had to go talk to the financial people about the contribution margin benefit, and how they're gonna support this. Mm -hmm. She had to go talk to the heart failure transplant attendings and the ICU attendings because they had a closed unit. They were gonna manage the complications. She had to go talk to her surgeons about potential complications like this. So when they happened, it wasn't a surprise. Then she had to go talk to her cath lab staff and do training about what they're gonna do and why they're gonna do it. And so, your ability to build a program is going to be based solely upon the effort and work you put in teaching everyone and realize 30% of the people are going to hate you and want to kill you no matter what you do. So those are people just to try and protect and avoid, don't engage. What you want to do is find the 70% who will support you and back you. And I just, that would be my advice for those things. Um, are there any questions from the group? We've tried to hit the chat as we go. If not, we're gonna turn Michael loose, see what he has to say. All right, thank you. I don't see any questions. All right, bud, it's all you. Have you got a job? Are you finishing or about to start? I don't actually I'm finishing. Know that. I'm finishing. Uh, I'm. Uh, I did half of the time at MGH with uh, Fruit Jaffer, and then half of the time with Kevin at uh, at Brigham. And where are you headed? And I'm going to University of Illinois at Chicago. Excellent. Um, that's. Uh, Let us know how we can help. Next next step. Oh yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'll, I'll do that for sure. And I I will add in, as you're building programs you are never a prophet in your own land. So one of the things that can be very important as you come into a new program is get somebody crazier and more known 
than you to come in and have all the fights. Because I don't know about Kevin and Sanjog, but I've given grand rounds and I've been to a lot of hospitals and everybody thinks they're going to get me that one question I don't know the answer to. And I've, we've always got it. And it's a lot better if they think I'm an asshole and you're the, actually the crazy thoughtful one or the same thoughtful one, then you're the crazy one. So I would really use your mentors and your friends and the community to come in and, you know, do grand rounds about complete revask, you know, take turns bashing on ischemia, talk about tactical excellence. But, you know, for everybody out there, that's a really important asset is bring in outsiders to help you lay some of the groundwork to be more successful as you get going. Sanjog, you're shaking your head, so. No, no, it's not shaking my head. I'm, I'm, I'm totally agreeing. I actually would take that a step further and say, you know, when, especially as new fellows coming out of these types of programs or even junior operators who are looking for their second job, um, when you're, when you're being looked at by a serious place and getting, you know, getting courted by the job that you're really interested in, the temptation is to roll over and say, I'll do anything you want, just give me a job, right? And that's probably the biggest mistake that you can make because, because we're, all a little, we're all a little differently brained in this specialty, right? Like we, <coughs> we have a certain way of looking at what we do and, and you know, you can describe it as hardcore or crazy or whatever you want, right? But we love what we do and we're going to push that envelope because that's what makes us us. And, and if you then go to a place and you have to do the grand rounds that you always have to do while you're interviewing, or you have to meet the usual people and answer all the questions, and you're not very clear to them that like, listen, this is what I bring, this is what I'm going to do. You have to understand that, you know, complications come with this and, you know, and that long cases come with this and dedicated cap time comes with this. Then if, if you're not straight about that, like I coming to Canada, I told them very clearly that, well, listen, you better have a black card, right? Cause I'm expensive, I'm not cheap. Right? And, and that's just the way it's gonna be. But in return, I will get you what you want, right? That's the, it's, you know, this is not me personally. It's just like, you can't do this stuff for free, right? There's equipment that's necessary. But being up front was so, imp it was so important about this. And as a result, it has made my life infinitely easier because within three weeks of when I got here, they were bugging me going, damn it, we need your list because we got all this money to spend on you and we need to make it happen, right? So, so be very frank, even if you, if you don't think it's what they want to hear, because ultimately that's you setting up a very important relationship. And, and the other thing is when you go to take your first job, talk to people that have gone and put a program together because of the list of things you should ask for. If you're a junior person, you have to be careful about that, but there are things you need that you may not anticipate that senior people and people that have negotiated for job support can be very helpful uh, to coach you to ask for. And, to Sanjok's point, you know, just expectation that there's going to be a gear request of at least 120K to get the de minimis needed to actually do your job. And so little things like that, when it's upfront, they anticipate it's coming, things go a lot smoother out of the try, as opposed to trying to assemble it once you're there. I always tell people, get a lawyer. Your, your lawyer's job is to make it not personal and get you what you need. That's what they do. Doctors are a bunch of weak rollovers. We don't like confrontation. We undervalue ourselves. So get a mean, vicious lawyer and let them do their best to negotiate for you. The other advantage of doing that is you are now not having the negotiation with the person you're going to work for. And you can, you can leave some bad blood um, if you negotiate for yourself. It's better that they hate your lawyer and like you than hate you. So sorry, Michael, go ahead. We've, we've chatted enough. Yeah, well, that is a, it's a whole different, it's probably a different, um, um, you know, session, like how to best interview for, for a CTO job. Um, there's so many nuances to it, and uh, I've, I've kind of gone through it, and I, I feel like the main problem is that the most pro programs don't even know um, what you have learned and who they're talking to, and um, they just see you as this young guy who just graduated fellowship, and uh you know even though they don't really know when you what it means when you start talking about coils or managing complications um those are things that they haven't done like in the last three years and you would be able to just do it but 
um, they still think you're just going to be that guy who, who who doesn't know what what he does. And then um, when you then talk about like, oh, you need this and this and that, and and that's what I want to do, then they get very scared um, and they think this guy's crazy. So it's a fine line um, between um, talking like Sanjok and um, presenting yourself in a way that it's actually still acceptable to them, so they can hire you. Yeah. And maybe once you've you have a few years uh you know under your belt and um, that maybe it may be easier to talk like sanjong when you interview for a job but i found um through the process that i you know needed to be actually very careful in how i how i present myself and um you know try to be as modest as possible and to to not scare <laughs> not scare anyone with what i want to do stop wearing a tie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's tough to not do that during interviews, right? Uh, we can stop wearing the tie right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> it bothers you. <laughs> don't have don't have scrubs, but uh, that's where we are. Here, I do have PowerPoint slides, unfortunately. Um, not okay. um, the uh, you know nice thing that Amy's doing here, but we can interrupt in between. Maybe um, come up with some questions in in between um, to keep this interactive. Um, so, you know, my case is an 84 year old man um, presented with unstable angina. He um, had a STEMI um, with emergent three vessel cabbage, uh, Lima to LAD, SVG to RPDA, and SVG to OM2 two years ago, two years prior to presentation. Has hyperlipidemia and kind of um, borderline severe aortic stenosis with a valve area of 1.2 square centimeters. Um, his uh, six months prior to coming to our institution, he had unstable angina at the outside hospital, had an impella assisted PCI there with atherectomy of the left main, left circumflex, and we'll see those pictures in a little while here. Um, but that was unsuccessful. Um, so we started on improved medical therapy with ADAPT and also Renexa was added to his regimen. Um, then on four antianginals. Um, two months later, he had a second attempt uh, a left main CERC PCI. Also, that was unsuccessful. And a day prior to presenting, he had an exercise stress test because they wanted to enroll him for cardiac rehab because they had, uh, you know, decided they can't be successful with this uh, left main PCI, and he's always going to uh, be like this. Um, but on the stress test, he had angina and uh, four millimeter precordial ST depressions, uh, so he was transferred to um, our ED. Um, the cath um, we'll see showed a 99% calcified left main lesion and also a vein graft to the one. Uh, I'm sorry, did you just say they put an impella in and then didn't actually do a PCI? They, I think they did get a wire through and they tried to orthorectomize it, but I think the orthorectomy did not like succeed. Um, oh, okay. So they, they started the PCI, but they couldn't finish it. Got it. Yeah. And um, his, his echo had an EF, normal EF, um, inferior wall motion abnormalities, um, the severe as we talked about, um, mean gradient was only about 23 though. Uh, 25. And uh, he had a stress test, which um, from the outside hospital, they don't have a lot of details about that, but basically showed a fixed inferior inferior lateral defect. Um, but that was just um, a spec, uh, which is another discussion, you know, in CTO PCI specs, basically, um, how much can you trust them? And especially if you have triple vessel disease and you have scar in one area, number one, that scar could still be viable territory and could be just hibernating and then also how much else are you missing which is one reason why we sent so many people uh, uh, for pets uh, pet, pet stress tests uh, especially at Brigham and, uh, and, and coronary CTs are very valuable to will also um, and then uh, you know we had a hard team meeting um, where basically we discussed doing the cabbage AVR versus um, PCI plus TAVR uh, which involves surgery team, a structural team, um, uh, and the complex PCI team as well. Um, he had an extremely high syntax score, um, somewhere in the 50 area. Um, STS score was 7%, and um, 
ultimately the decision was made for higher speeds yeah just because the surgeons did not want to um, touch them um, you see his uh, 99% left main here with with also very calcified osteal um, circ lesion which is also very tight hey, um, Mike, I think the yeah. angios aren't showing oh they are oh, they're, they're playing they're playing they're just a bit slower I see it it looks like uh, Christmas I can't uh, I, I can't do anything else I, it, it's playing for me um, perfect you're good. We're, we're all sure. good. Now so it's coming see, through. Great. Thank you. Okay, yeah, great. Maybe with says she's in you see some competitive flow in the in the LAD here because the Lima is patent and um, very little competitive flow in the CERC system. Um, there's this one graft here, which is competitively filled somewhat. Um, you know, you see it going up there a little bit in this OM2. And um, the, the problem we can see here is also um, how we're going to wire this later, right? Because it's like right after the um, calcified um, lesion there, it goes right down. Um, we have uh, the OM, SVG to OM here. Um, there's this touchdown lesion with very weak back filling here, not much of the surf system filled back. And um, SVG to our PDA um, looks okay, but it's um, this um, kind of maybe scar territory in Lima to LAD here on the right side. So I'm going to assume because we have a bunch of sycophants on, but anyone on earth that sends this person for redo cabbage should be shot. <laughs> Keep going, Mike. That's called being honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's called being so, old and tired. So <laughs> there was actually they will expect. <laughs> so would you would you even um, do something? You know, because uh, there was a lot of discussion. Actually, you know, he's having patent grafts. You know, his patent graft to the search system, patent graft to the LED, patent graft to the um, RCA. So like, you know, it can't be so bad. What's going on? Like, um, you know, that, why why that giant OM and the giant PL, and he's got angina. Well, that could be the valve, right? Should we just replace, just, should we just do a taver maybe? Um, but, um, you know. Oh yeah, I forgot. Taver makes people live longer, PCI doesn't. Forgot that one, sorry, man. So you can see we did not <laughs> proceed with a taver next, um, but we, we did proceed with the PCI here. Um, we did have, have an eight French guide in the left main. And also you see a six French guide up there um, uh, from the left femoral in the graph, just in case we'd need to um, right. go retrograde through that. And um, we started wiring this with a uh, Pilot 200 and um, Supercross here to get around the curve, um, the angle into the um, circ, which, you know, this is the abbreviated video of it. There was a lot of um, attempts. And finally, the wire made it in it, um, didn't advance readily. So we had to advance the Supercross a little bit around the curve. And that allowed the um, wire to go down the circ completely. Um, you see it all the way here in the AV groove, um, but the wire was occlusive in the left main, especially essentially immediately after wiring this, um, the became, patient became very hypotensive with, uh, you know, a levofet of 70 at the time, an epi of seven. Um, and, you know, that was kind of unexpected to us because, you know, you think this guy has three graphs. Yes, you know, he has a huge circ territory, which is not, um, you know, profuse, but, um, you know, that just this one wire would make him look so bad um, was somewhat unexpected for us. Otherwise, we would have had an impeller in there already, um, especially because we didn't think this would be easy to get the impeller um, through the um, very calcified, like, tight aortic valve. Mm -hmm. um, so the next um, step here um, was that the patient um, started to code, um, CPR was performed, um, he was intubated by anesthesia, um, which again brings into play all the different um, players you should probably talk before, talk to before doing these procedures. And 
you know, also a little bit, it makes me scared. Like you, you have a case of a protective left main uh, where you think, oh yeah, you can do this in the beginning. Um, maybe not so bad to protect you, but, but you know, it can still end up like this. Um, so which cases, you know, are appropriate to take and which ones should you stay away from? Um, and, you know, maybe sometimes you can't really tell in the beginning and you get into these things um, that you'd rather stay out of, but then you're in there and you just um, maybe hope that the guy in the cath lab next to you is, is, is good so he can help you. But uh, this patient was intubated, um, had a, a short VF arrest, was defibrillated, started on amiodarone. We fortunately had the guide already um, with access on the other side, so we switched that. Um, for a 14 French impeller sheath, um, balloon the aortic valve, and then um, put an impeller in um, through the left femoral artery. And uh, a temporary pacing wire as well. And the patient was uh, stabilized. Sorry, this is skipping a little quicker than I want. And there's another 42 gray hairs for Dr. Chris. Uh, yeah, this, this one I actually don't know. I think this is my good friend Farouk. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's All not, right. uh, yeah, not, not uh, Kevin's uh, doing here. Got Let's it. See if I can, that can play. You can always tell the difference anyway, so, between so where the they come from because MGH has Siemens and we have Philips, and the images are grainier on the Siemens system. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I believe Farouk is on. <laughs> You're in trouble. Oh, that's great point. <laughs> no, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the many points of banter among which wire you start with, what favorite microcatheter, and what branches require rescuing that we've uh, co-pollinated by having fellows that go back and forth. So it's been really right. nice, actually. <laughs> like I said, breaks yeah, down the time I choose the case of a, of a thinner guy, so you're not bashing MDH too much. <laughs> Um, <laughs> All right, what do you got here, man? So, what do you so got? we also try to we also try to do the orthorectomy here. Um, one five four first, we do, because that would be you know in a left main good way to start. Um, this was a turnpike LP, the, a turnpike spiral actually that followed the um, a pilot two hundred. We switched it out for the rotor wire. Uh, one five four didn't cross. One two five four trying to just make a little channel. Um, did make some progress, but basically stalled in the, you know, angle into the circ and uh, was a no cross. So we then switched the wire to more supportive uh, wiggle wire, trying to think that maybe we can make a little channel by, by getting one of, at first a 1.5 balloon, which didn't cross, one of um, sapphire, uh, which made it down here, um, but didn't really make progress all the way through the lesion. So we just inflated it there. Um, still unable to cross all the way down into this. Um, so at that point, you know, thinking about, um, we also have this point of, um, you know, how to develop a relationship with industry and uh, thinking of all, always uh, these uh, uh, device reps sit in the control room and you're trying to use the, the um, device that they uh, promote. Um, so there was no CSI guy sitting there, but uh, we decided, you know, the rotor didn't cross. So let's see if maybe the CSI somehow with the nose cone um, makes it differently around the curve. Um, so we, we did the orbital arthrectomy, and you can see how that actually um, popped through here into the circumflex, which, you know, very um, unexpected to me. I would always think like, you know, the, that really grinds like at the very tip of it uh, would be better. But I guess in this situation, maybe there was, you know, it's already a little channel into the cert, but it's more the issue of getting around the corner, uh, which is maybe um, uh, better done by the orbital here. Um, that created a channel. And um, afterwards, basically, we just, um, you know, switched it to Xion Blue and um, dilated with multiple balloons and C balloons, um, stented into the circ and 3.0 stent, 3.5 stent in the left main, all were post-dilated to 4.0. And you can see how there's now flow um, 
back into the OMs and also much more down into the um, LAD than it was before. Um, in the OM only up to the point where the graft, um, you know, severe lesion is here. So let me ask you a question, Michael, because I always, I always like to think a little bit about um, if you could go back, what would you do different? So if I went back, um, knowing all everything I know now, um, yeah. I would, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, one thing actually, you know, I, I mean, ideally you'd have an impeller in there already because then the patient probably wouldn't call the way he did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at least there was the second axis and that's something we oftentimes do to have at least like the other sheath in there. Um, but in someone where you anticipate it's going to be very hard to cross the belt, maybe it's actually worth to, to have that in there. And um, just, you know, I think the anatomy actually trumps the EF um, because, you know, you, we did say his EF is normal, 65%. Um, but just last week, we also had another case where we did a retrograde CTO and, um, you know, there were all patent septals, uh, like multiple septals going to this RCA. And, um, you know, just by crossing this one septal, this patient became so hypotensive that he also needed an um, uh, impeller and, and, you know, chest compressions for a little while, and, um, extended uh, ICU stay afterwards um, to recover, recover from this presumed like myocardial stunning potentially, but not even like a decrease in blood flow. So, I, you know, Especially, in the, but then on the other hand, you know, Kevin and I have done so many cases where, you know, we put the impeller in and then afterwards we have to deal with the groin bleeds also. Um, so it, it, it's a tough um, kind of, um, you know, fine line again to walk, like, are you going with the impeller or not going with the impeller? Um, I, I don't really see how we could have opened the um, a lesion quicker to get flow down there, which is obviously the thing that um, you know helps the most. Yeah, so, so I think uh, let me. I guess I'll interject just to. I'll give you my Monday morning quarterback view of this. So first yeah. of all, the fact that you're not sure is important, and I don't think anybody can be sure. That's why this is called high risk PCI. If if Sanjog, Kevin, Farouk, Erasi, Lorenzo, anybody on this call knew the people who were going to collapse and die before we did them, we wouldn't do them, right? But unfortunately, we're not God. So if you're going to get into this business, this is the stuff you get to deal with all the time because you can't predict. It. Now, I would tell you, institutionally, this person would have got a TAVR first. As long as they could get an Edwards valve and stay out of the coronary heights, We'd have done the valve first. That's the more critical issue. And by eliminating the valve, all the hemodynamic consequences get reduced dramatically. And the need to put an appella in probably goes down. If you have to, it's still easier. Um, I know there are programs and I know the person who's promoting doing BAV and then putting an appella. And I think that's wrong. And the reason being is fix the valve. If it's, if it's so bad, you need to do a BAV to put the impella in, and you're going to take the risk of the BAV, just put the valve in. The only reason the valve guys aren't doing that is they want you to take the mortality, not them. And I think that's not the right way to handle it. It's passing the buck. So my world, the first thing I would have thought about is doing the valve before I did the PCI. The second thing I would bring up is a lot of people probably couldn't or may not have been able to wire that, okay? So then you have to think about is if I couldn't wire the circuit, because that angle was really tight. I mean, what you guys did, the supercross, the pilot, I mean, that was really hard. So other things to think about is put the wire into the LAD and drill the left main to LAD with a 1.5 and then a 2.0 burr and to bulk a ton of the plaque changing the angle into the circ, that would be an option. The other option would be, good is, point. The other option would be go down the vein graft, the anastomotic angle was sweet, go retrograde and get on an externalized wire. Um, 
And that would be another option. And that's not, to, you guys did a great job, but I always want people is you should be thinking about if this didn't work or I couldn't execute it, what else could I have thought about doing? So I think those would be the things that I would think about is I would think about the timing of the valve potentially different. And, you know, then I would, I, I think I would think about those. Other than that, beautiful result, well done. What questions did you want to bring out from this? Yeah, so, you know, one thing is like, how do we select cases? Um, in the beginning, um, starting out, starting out a program, and also, you know, those kind of cases oftentimes come, you know, when they're in clinic, you could say, well, you know, let's just do six months more of medical therapy until I'm, you know, a little bit more established. But on the other hand, like they come as inpatient add-ons, right? And um, like now it's yours, and um, you know, how do you how do you maneuver those? Yeah, I think Michael, the most important thing you have at your first job. It's no a place that wants you there and is going to be supportive because in your first week, if you're going to start doing these cases, it's nice to get a senior partner that has some legitimacy and been there that can be with you for the first several, especially for the ultra high risk ones, because that automatically diffuses a little bit of the decision making across people who are well known to the institution and you have a track record of doing well. If something goes wrong, you did it together. It's not the new guy that had his death in his first week or two. And so, you know, and that the, the most important thing you should choose a job with your partners because you spend a lot of time with them. And if they're not nice people, your first job can frankly suck. And then a lot of the good stuff that happens with employment comes from that. They're supportive, they help you, you teach them, they teach you. You'll have skills that they don't have, and vice versa, they'll have the experience that you don't have. And I mean, that that's the win in your first bit of employment. But I think also, you know, you're right. If this person gets to refer to you in clinic, it's wait six months is the wrong answer. And so trying to get a little bit of help early with a co-operator that's known would be my best advice for this. Sanjog, you went through this recently being younger than I am. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, the most people are going to, going to value you if they see that you're totally driven by the best outcome for the patient. That's really what's most important. And that, if you, if you put that in your belly as your guiding principle, it shines on you. People see it. And that means if you are not comfortable doing a case, say no. If you're not ready, if you don't feel like you're ready, say no. There's nothing wrong with that. But make sure that you then make the effort to get the patient the care that they need, which means refer it to somebody else, right? And say, I would love to be there when you do this case, or I would love to scrub with you when you do this case. And that's where your senior partner being, being available to you becomes very, very valuable. And to be honest, the, the community will see that this case was brought to you. You not recognize limitations, but you recognize complexity when you see it. So that's the case selection piece. And you understand that four hands are better than two, two brains are better than one, four eyes are better. Right. So that's point one. Yes and no. And and well, ish. If 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 uh, if if those other two eyes are yours, they're, they're better. No, I, I I've just seen. I I also know that I've seen couples in the cath lab, yeah. Not not be mutually beneficial. Right. It can be somewhat destructive. So you gotta you that, you have a good that relationship. That those two those other eyes need to be the right set of eyes. Hundred percent. The, the other important thing is, um, and this is my this is my practice. I don't know if others do it, but when I'm taking on these high risk cases, I find that discussing them amongst the potential stakeholders is really important. So this case, for example, I might have talked to my cavity team or to my toroid valve surgeon yeah. carefully about it to make sure that they had their hands on this file. When we bring high risk cases at our institution here in Toronto. We have a really nice developed mechanism where the, the heart failure surgeons, the entire heart failure team, the referring cardiologists, and the anest cardiac anesthesiologists are all on a call. We do this twice a week. And that's where these high-risk cases come up. And I, to be honest, I brought the minority for discussion. That's where the majority of my referrals come from because that discussion helps those people understand that I'm, I'm interested in patient care above being the one to do the work. 
And then very importantly, that informed consent discussion is everything. And it's not to, it's not because it's about covering your rear end. It's because that's really where your patient learns that, you know, looks in your eyes and knows that you're about them, not about their corners. That informed consent discussion should happen with another member of the team in the room for the first while, potentially the referring physician or the heart player team or the CCU team so that they can see that you are data driven, that you're honest, that you're not going to over promise and, and that the, the informed consent discussion that you have then you pen as the attending in your own hand, you, draw, you write that note yourself and sign it yourself so that everyone who sees that chart sees that as the attending, you take responsibility for what's been said and you've been honest with the patient and you've been you know, decent enough to make sure that that note is there because that point of contact then for that procedure, whether it goes well or goes unwell, is going to come back to how well it, everybody sees that you communicated your thoughts, not only to the patient, but to those around, you, right? So it's, it's all of that comes down to the same principle, right? Put the patient first every time, over and over and over again, put the patient first every time. You can talk. I, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll add a little flavor to this. First, the other most important person to have in the room when you do consent is a family member, because yeah. that's who's gonna sue you. Sure. So in our program, all of our outpatient visits, we require or we request that a family member or someone else witnesses the discussion so that they understand what we're getting. And we spend more time consenting them actually than the patient because the patient's just, they don't care. They just want to get treated. But those are the people who need to be on board that you're being thoughtful, that you give a damn, and that you're trying to do the right thing. The, the second thing that I'll say, and this is a challenge for our profession. Number one is all of you are going to come out better technically than everyone in the cath lab you're about to work with. Um, and I would tell you, Catherine, I'm going to expect you're probably as good or better than Dave coming out. God bless Dave, but you're going to be really good. And so the way you keep that skill set up, though, is to use your skill. So what I would tell you is, it's not about avoiding a complication. Nobody can avoid complications in a reliably predictive way because if we had better predictor models, we wouldn't do it. What you need to know is be prepared to handle it, be prepared to manage it, be thoughtful about the indication and keep your skill up. And so one of the things I tell you, like I always tell this story. So Robert Riley, my first chip fellow, went to the Christ, the big giant program in Cincinnati and his first case, and he had been told by every faculty member here, don't do anything risky when you get started. Put every faculty person on earth, don't do what you were trained to do, do something safer. And all you're gonna do is lose your skill sets if you do that. So I told Robert the opposite. I said, you do what you were trained to do. Be thoughtful, do the appropriate thing for the appropriate reasons, make sure you have good informed consent, and have total team buy-in. So his first case was an 87-year-old with an EF of 20, a calcified distal left main that was going to need roto into both branches that had turned down by the surgeons and every interventionist at the Christ. That was his first case. And he did an impella, roto both branches, did a DK crush, patient went home the next day. So I would just tell you is it's not about not doing high-risk cases. I think it's more about being thoughtful about what you're doing and make sure you understand the environment you're working in to be successful. Now, we were just talking about the fact that we have two new surgeons here. You know what? Amazingly enough, their outcomes have not been super great this year. And do you know who the first person to walk to every attending our heart failure people? I'm like, well, that's not a surprise. They're new. You know, it's going to take them time. So we just have to be prepared for that. And we want to support them and we're going to help them. Um, and we tell them when they're like, oh my God, we got to bring this guy down to the OR or to the cath lab. Like, great, it's okay. We got you back. We'll take care of it. That's what we're here for, right? Nobody's perfect. And so you need to make sure that you're going you're gonna to have worse outcomes. I mean, I'm about to do that to my own partner. I'm going to leave for a hundred days. 
Kate is going to be here on her own. She is going to have bad things happen. She's going to have stuff occur that if I were around, maybe I'd have done the case. Maybe I could have got her out of it. But in the end, it's time for her to go through that process and learn it. And we all do. So I, I, I really want all of you to think in a measured way of it's not about avoiding risk. It's about being thoughtful about how we're going to manage that risk and setting expectations with your partners, with the program, with the cath lab about what's going to happen. And I think those are the critically important pieces to me as you move forward. The, the second piece I would tell you, Michael, is if you don't have phone numbers for Mark Ricciardi, Mark Goodwin, and Tony Martini, reach out and I'll give them to you or one of us can give them to you because those are your three CTO people in that area that it, if you think the patient should get treated, but you're worried about the risk and your ability to manage it, then you send it to those guys, okay? Those people, because that's, yeah. those, are, those are your help, okay? And, and listen, all they wanna do is help you. They're not trying to steal your cases. They're not trying to do stuff. Any one of those guys is mean to you, you call me and I'll kick their ass, okay? Good. I, I'm the old yeah. guy. No, I'm not afraid of anybody in this community. So, <laughs> all right. Are there any other questions out there? We're getting late. Michael, do you have anything more to say? What's your own thought on general anesthesia? Um, you know, in this case, like it would have been really um, good to have this person intubated in the beginning. And, um, you know, I see a big difference between already two institutions, MJH and Brigham, where they're like, um, you know, uh, differences in how patients are selected for general anesthesia. What is your, um, you know, what are your criteria to um, um, do upfront general anesthesia for someone? So if I had an anesthesiologist I trusted and I could control and they didn't cost me an extra hour or a case to do the case, I think doing with general anesthesia is the greatest thing ever. Wyman has that, he has, he has his own anesthesiologist. And it's the greatest, slickest thing ever. The problem is most of our institutions, uh, our anesthesia, I don't know about you, Sanjog and Kevin, but our anesthesiologists at times are not the most helpful people on earth. I'm lucky. I have amazing chronic anesthetists who have recently been supporting a ton of my cases. Uh, I do admit that it adds on a significant amount of time. To the case. A significant amount of time. Uh, and that's maybe something we've got to work on, right? As a as a process, but but I don't want that to undermine their value and their utility because man, they're good. Yep. They're real good. Yeah, we we have amazing support, Bill. They're um, they're staffed to help us. They'll run a tabular and run a complex PCI. We do a lot of deeper MAC than our nurses can do. It does slow things down because they have their own sort of evaluation process, which is a little bit more involved than ours, but yep. it pays tremendous dividends just in terms of in-case stability in my ability to manage case and not have to negotiate with the nurse, whether it's safe or not to give more versed and sentinel. So um, we also, but to, to the program building piece, like I gave cardiac anesthesia grand rounds at the Brigham and we built a lot of bridges. They're some of my closest friends now. It's been a joy to have them. It does come at an expensive time, but for super high risk cases, it's really nice to have them there. And I, as I visited friends, I realized, you know, colleagues at very good centers will complain. If I want anesthesia for an elective CTO, it's booking a week and a half out and we get them readily by next day. But we've also made a commitment to use them enough where they can justify the staff. So they tend to be sometimes in cases where maybe it's not entirely necessary, but you know, we need them to be able to build and be part of the team. So we're happy to have them. And it slows them down a little bit. It's a cost of doing business. At the Sanjog point, we've been trying to work on a little bit. So. I, I'm distracted by the giant Sanjog in your window. Oh, now there's a giant me in your window because <laughs> you can see the reflection off your monitor. Um, <laughs> Lorenzo was bringing up a point. And I would say, so Lorenzo, our, our high-risk clinic, we have surgeons nearby. So we've not formalized it as much as the structural people, but we really would like to. So the afternoon, there's a cardiothoracic surgeon with my clinic. Kate has her clinic with one of our other surgical attendings. So we really do prefer 
sharing our outpatient clinics together to facilitate same day consultations or you know when there's you know in theory academic equipoise that we can we can share that and again the, the key is your surgeons are not your competitors they're actually your best customers and they're your savers because you know what nobody attacks the surgeons when they have bad outcomes they always attack us if we have one so having them on your side can go a long way to help protect the, the program which is what it's about but you know the 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 clinic environment for us is a it's not the standard um especially when it's virtual it's not the standard like sort of meet greet let's sit down and really have a chat with the surgeon and the interventionist together where possible but and and in canada it's a little different because there's so there's much fewer cath labs so you know volume and referral volume per cath lab is you know is nuts for whatever you choose to do there's always going to be something um, but but for our surgeons i think we have a nice friday morning conference every morning at seven o'clock where all of the surgical referrals from outside or anything that's re really even remotely complex ends up getting discussed amongst the referring docs. Of several of our echo cardiologists get on the call so that we can look over echoes and the surgeons and the interventionists are on. So we do discuss both structural interventional versus surgical and coronary. And it's like a good discussion, right? But, but I think the tone of that is, you know, for someone who's coming on new is set early by your attitude right so you know go out and try to meet the surgeons and and get to know them and tell them a little bit about what you do and how you're looking forward to having them as your partner so that you know on those calls when you say well you know i think this is technically a very good result that can be achievable with pci but but also with surgery so i think it's reasonably the patient's patient's decision these are the data these is what i think they, they don't feel like they're it's that's threatening that's just you're adding to a discussion, and and that combined that combined format is important. So we're we're getting a little bit on the end of time, but I want to ask something that it, that that's important to me. I think for people early in their career, we've touched on this, but I'm not sure it's always necessarily someone in your program. So I'll start with you, Kevin. Talk to me about mentorship and coaching as you move along your career. Yeah, so I mean, uh, mentorship is not always at your institution because some of the stuff that we do is very outside of the expertise of people. So they're, they're, it kind of falls into a bunch of different buckets. Someone that wants to take care of you and see you succeed who's more senior than you that's going to help research you to do that. That's super important mentorship. And again, that's what you should look for in your first job and, and try to vet that that's going to happen, either that it's happened to other people that are mid-career and can speak to the culture of the place. But and then, you know, from a technical mentorship, and the nice thing about this community is the things that we do, there are lots of people that were, are willing to teach and help and help forward our skills as a colleague base. And to, to Bill's point earlier, Michael, all the people that Bill mentioned would be glad to have you come along if you refer to patients to them. They would celebrate the chance to have you part of it. And, and I've actually brought cases to Bill for my training across the country that I've sailed on. And so there are things I've appreciated and I've learned from. And Having that base of friends that can help you up your game over time in a stepwise fashion is one of the nice parts of being involved in complex PCI. You know, the mentorship piece locally, it, it, it typically is someone that has a little bit of resources and a little bit of path to how to be successful. And then as opportunities come up, they're also um, invested enough in your well-being where they will help give you those opportunities and maybe not take all of them for themselves. And so... You know, we now have two junior complex PC operators at our hospital, and I think pretty actively in terms of what do they need, how can we help them get better, and, and help them to get their career started. And I think just being an environment that's supportive of that. Not every environment is. Sometimes you need to have a sense of rugged individualism and go and grab stuff for yourself. But to the extent that you're um, in a beneficiary of an environment that has people that care about you, those are the jobs to look for as you go out and interview. And Michael and I had lots of conversations about that as he was interviewing. And it was really funny, a couple of the people that called me um, to get references for Michael, I started to reverse interview them. You know, this guy's well-trained, this is what he needs. If you want him to be successful, this is a job type. These are the responsibilities he should be doing. And so 
I sort of gave a little bit of expectation creation that we have a precious resource that you're getting, you're going to be really lucky to have, but you also have a responsibility to pony up and make a job for him or her that's going to allow them to be successful. And so, you know, thinking about what those institutions are as you look for jobs, go to your mentors and ask them their perspective on the environment, what you've been told about how you work and what your week looks like and the types of people you'll be surrounded by. Sanjak, talk to me about coaching. How much better at CTOs are you now than when you went out to practice? And how did you do that? Yeah, that, um, I think um, I think I'm a lot better now than I was when I started. Uh, and I think that's a lot of that is learning from mistakes, learning from others, but having a lot of really good people on speed dial, including you, right? Like I, I you know, I, I think coaching around, it's not just about CTO PCI. Actually, I, I think the technical aspects of stuff you, you know, you, you practice, you get better at, you'll bounce cases off your partners, you'll bounce cases off of experts in the field, you'll attend meetings, you'll get proctors, blah, 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 all the usual stuff that we keep hearing about. But it's about being better at your practice, right? Better at your life, better at your job. And, and that, the, the psychological toll of what we do is not insignificant, right? And it is, it is important to recognize the amount of effect that your headspace has on your hands and, and how well you can do what you do. So the most important coaching I think I've gotten since I finished was like life coaching, right? Like, like I, you know, I'm having a crappy day. Like my, my, my go-to, my boys are Rob Riley and Darshan Doshi. We like, call each other back and forth all the time. We have a text chain saying ridiculous things on almost a day-to-day -day basis, sending stupid ass pictures of, you know, of each other, just to make sure that we're still on the same page. And, and then when we have a bad day, then those are, those are my speed dials, right? So that I can, I can download and, and vice versa. And that's our, those are, those relationships can't be, the value can't be quantified because nobody else gets it like they get it. Because we're all contemporaries and we all came out early. And, and then about life, you know, the things that they can't necessarily answer that, you know, Bill's been through or that Ajay's been through or that DK's been through, like, you know, like Jeff, like these are the people where when I need life advice because of the effect that the job that we have has on my whole sphere, these are the people that I talk to. And that coaching, I can't, I can, I can't put a price on because it's helped me direct who I've become as a, as an operator, as a teacher, as a physician, as a, as a parent, as a husband, right? Like these are, because you make mistakes very easily that you don't realize you're making until you're told, idiot, you're making a mistake, back up, right? So, so I, 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 I can't, the more advice you get, even though you don't necessarily have to agree with it, maybe it'll take you a little bit of time to, you know, get it. As a young operator going out into this job, this is a funny beast. Your, 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 your colleagues who don't do this work will not understand necessarily the toll that it takes and the, the environment that you're trying to set up. And that's where you lean on the people who have walked this road before you, some with machetes in front of them, AKA Bill Lombardi, right? You know, clearing a pathway through this forest so that that you, you learn from their scars and from their bleeds and, and you try to avoid the sharp branches that are gonna get in your way. Does that, does that make sense, Bill? Is that, you know? That, that's in the game. That's Kevin, I got, I got a question. Mm -hmm. Is it technically hard or emotionally hard? Which is tough, which is, which is do you think the, the bigger price doing CTS? <laughs> it depends on the person, actually, right? <laughs> uh, so some people are super emotional and very thoughtful, and other people struggle on a different technical term. And so that's an individual thing that we all have to be introspective about. I mean, I probably could give you my answer, but... <laughs> yeah, I want <laughs> your answer. That's what I'm, I'm asking for you. Part of this is people need to realize we're people. Yeah. So, I mean... So, so I think... Uh, so technically, I got really good at ADR before I got good at retrograde. So it's just something I need to do more of. And I was actually pissed at myself for, for a long time. Because, I mean, often many people that are high-functioning and do this job are our own 
worst self critic, right? <laughs> so emotionally, like I had the metal to do this, I could stomach complications, I feel like I was thoughtful, I could sleep at the end of the day because the patient was usually on the table for the right reason. I spoke with their family and I had buy-in for my partners. For me, that never was a struggle, but you know, trying to strive for excellence and do the best job I can when I uh, failed at those things, I tended to be pretty self-critical. So learning that some amount of failure and some amount of complication, as you guys have already articulated, comes along with the job, something that takes getting used to because, you know, we all got A's to get into medical school and want to be 100% successful, I think a little bit by phenotype, but learning that, you know, failure is a part of this and that we learn from it and get better from it took me a little getting used to. I'm really used to it now because it's part of the job and I've been doing it long enough, but I definitely had to lick my wounds for the first couple of years. There were a few points like I can sit here and get paid to stand to do right heart tasks, or I could spend four hours trying not to perforate someone's epicardial. I'm like, I think this is the right job for me, but there were a couple of moments there early on where it was stressful. I had no goddamn idea what I was doing, and I was worried I was going to kill some father. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> so one, one anecdote from that is I had a heinous perforation. I got the patient better, and I looked over at my favorite tech, and I said, dude, I should have just been a farmer. And that was like the whole point of that emotion. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this kid. The next day, he comes back with a Tonka truck of a John Deere tractor and gives it to me. And so I'll never forget that as long as I live. Those types of relationships and the support even that guy gave That's me awesome. after a really long day it was wonderful. <laughs> hey, Amy, I have a question for you as we get about to be done. So there's some fellows about to start their high-risk PCI fellowship. You're about to end. If you could look back to yourself a year ago, what advice would you give yourself about, what your, what, about your journey? Mm, Bring that's Kleenex. a tough one. <laughs> I'm <bringing Kleenex. laughs> I'm cutting. Oh, um, you know, it's a long haul. And I think you gave me some really good advice in the middle of my first interventional year, which was, this is not just a sprint anymore. You've already gotten into fellowship. Now you're in a high risk fellowship. You, you know, you have to do things that sustain you. you. You do the work during the day, but you have to, you know, do the things that keep you moving forward. And you also have to forgive yourself. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to you know, think, well, I thought I had all the steps of reverse cart down. How did I forget to pin the wire in the guide extension? You know, I mean, how many times did I do that? Um, but, you know, I, I think you just have to, you have to give yourself some grace and realize that this is a really hard thing that we're learning and you learn it in strange pieces that are out of order and on patients who are sicker than you can possibly imagine. And you're going to get to do a piece of it here and a piece of it there. And eventually it's going to come together. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it, and just never forget that it's, it's a privilege to be a part of this community and to be working towards being a better operator. And even if you feel like you failed that day, just get up the next day and keep going. And, you know, I think that's something I've learned over time, especially watching you, you know, come in day in, day out, watching Kate come in day in, day out, Jamie, you know, we all make mistakes, but you got to get up the next day and, you know, give it your best effort. Bill, Catherine asked a good question. Um, oh, I missed it, so what is it? Yeah, she asked a question, any advice on relationship with industry and how that piece of the puzzle fits in as an early career operator? Kevin, you wanna take that or you want me to do it? I, yeah, I I'm happy to start. I mean, you know, as I've been doing this 12 years, a couple of the most fun things I'm doing scientifically are new device and technology development with industry. It sort of harnesses a part of your brain that you don't always get to use in cases. And having done a lot of science training before I came to be a, a focused PC operator, it, it kind of validates the time I spent getting a PhD in vascular biology. So it gives you opportunity to do things that out, are outside of your normal job scope, which I think can be professionally satisfying for the right person. Um, things like clinical research are facilitated, obviously, by industry, and so, you know, we have a pretty busy clinical trial unit and have involvement in those, and I find those types of aspects of my relationship with industry very professionally okay. satisfying. Um, you know, I think there's a lot that industry has to offer. You also have to be careful about how uh, close you are with them and not being sort of tied to one company and having balance and 
making sure you make decisions for patients and in procedures that are related to best practice and not industry influence. And I think most people have a good heart and probably don't get into trouble with that. But, you know, it, it, there, there are some people who are not immune to some of the influence and, and you'll see that in your practice. And so be balanced, be measured, understand that the type of work you can do in the industry it can be unique, it be, can be multifaceted, and a lot of times it can be fun. And be super careful with negotiating conflict of interest rules at your institutions and, you know, things like publishing papers and disclosing, because there are some lightning rod opportunities to get in trouble around that. So I think if you use your conscience, you use your moral compass, all this stuff tends to work out fine. And for me, it's been some very professionally satisfying work I've gotten into over the many several years I've been at this. Yeah, I, I'll echo what, what Kevin said. I would tell you is number one, um, be nice to everybody in the industry. Remember, they're going in labs and teaching people and setting culture. So teach them. The second is a lot of the people you're meeting now will someday be the VPs of the company. And so that relationship you built 15 years ago pays off a lot as you go along because it's nice sometimes to be able to say, I need to talk to this person about that. And so having that very built relationship is good. Um, two, they're gonna use you and you're gonna use them and be careful about how that relationship goes. Um, and there's a term called moral slippage where you, you're doing something because, and then three years later, you've just eaten away at your values and you wake up and you're like, how did I get here? So be very careful. And I, I will tell you, I mean, when I started, I was the Abbott, the Abbott person. Then I was the Bridgepoint person. Then I was the Boston Scientific person. Then I was the Abbott person. And all I would tell you is all I've tried to do is be very consistent. Um, most people in the industry don't come talk to me anymore unless they want to hear an honest opinion. And I would tell you is if you're in a case and you're picking a device that you think is inferior to another one, then you're picking it for the wrong reasons. And what you should tell the industry people is, hey, I'm going to teach and I'm going to do my case. And if you don't like what I'm going to do, then don't support me. It's not worth it. You just make sure you're doing the right thing. There's too many politicians in this profession. We don't need them. We need people who are authentic and real. And those are the people who are great educators. Again, it's important to have a relationship with industry, but it's also important that you help industry not just sell devices, but actually treat patients like they're their parents. And I, there are a couple of companies right now that are incredibly aggressive in sales. And I'm sure in their hearts, they believe what they're doing is saving lives, but I think at times it's a little over the top. And so you just need to be thoughtful about how you're gonna have that relationship with people and be careful. And the second is also, if you're in a situation and it feels sort of weird, that's what you have mentors for and run it by them um, to help sort of, is this really how this should go or not go? Or, you know, it, I, I had one of my fellows had an interesting discussion with industry and I basically had to go to their boss and say, pound sand, stop talking to him. Um, Cause we're not gonna play the game the way you're trying to play. So realize at times you may need some help sort of protecting you to, to move on. So Micah, we're gonna end here with you. What's your advice for the next generation about to start? Well, if you are, if uh, if you know uh, that you're you're going to be bored by just putting in simple stents uh, uh, 15 years from now, uh, then that's the thing for you, and um, you're not going to regret it. Um, you know, all of these are really great mentors, and I think this extra year is worth every single day that you spend in it because it um, makes you an even better operator. You know, once you finish your interventional fellowship, you think you're so good, you're coming from a great institution. And, um, you know, every day you spend in your CTO fellowship it will make you realize that there are so many things out there that you're not good at and uh, that you are getting better at and uh, that you will need to keep getting better at uh, after your training. 
um, it, it really humbles you every single day. And, um, you know, I think um, just having that experience is already worth something over, um, you know, not having that experience. Um, and and um, I think it will just um, make you a better operator, a more thoughtful operator, um, you know, a better person. Um, so I think you're doing the right thing and uh, you're on the right path if you're in this group of, uh, you know, uh, 17 people who've made it uh, to the end. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything else. All right. Well, with that, everybody, thank you. I know we ran a little late. I hope everybody found this valuable. Next month, we're going to have a couple of cases of left main PCI and talk a little bit about some of the tips, tricks, risks, and complications of that. Dimitri Karpilotis will be leading. I'm hoping that I'll get to be on this side of the equation again. Um, I will be somewhere in Alaska, so it'll depend on whether I have cell access or not, but hope they'll be there. To all of you on this journey, all of you who've been involved in the community for a long time, thank you for your support. I think this was a great kickoff. Sanjog, Kevin, thank you for coming in on short notice. It was fabulous. Amy, Mike, you guys did a super job. Thank you all. We'll see you next month. Uh, talk about left mains. You all, guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks.